Hello, beautiful people. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I hope you are just having like a stupendous week and that your week only gets better from here on out. It's so lovely to see you. If you haven't seen this face before, my name is Liz and I quite often sit here in this chair and talk about mostly true crime, but also unsolved mysteries, um, weird history with a few little conspiracy theories sprinkled in here and there. So if that sounds like stuff that might be of interest to you, then by all means hit subscribe, hit the bell, and we can just be like BFFs for life. No pressure, maybe a little. I, of course, as usual, have my supervisor slash production manager slash ruiner of life here with me uh editing liz let's switch to lily cam there she is lily girl you're getting settled in for the video she is very very codependent so she's never more than six feet away from me it's kind of like the opposite of social distancing so if you hear noises in the background i mean it's probably not a ghost it's just my dog ruining my life one video at a time Okay, so you know a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the murder of Emma Walker and I warned you guys about how mad and angry you were going to be? Today's case, guys, like I can't, I can't even. Like you guys are going to be hounding me for my address so you can send me the bill for the new blood pressure medication that you're on when we're done. That's how angry you're going to be. Now, I'm a little bit nervous about today's video, to be honest. It's a loaded case. There is a lot at play and opinions are very divided. The case we're looking at took place in the Philippines and the very complicated relationship between the Philippines and the US, which dates back to 1898 when the US bought the Philippines from Spain. That relationship plays a big part here. Also, while I've tried to be as thorough as I possibly could with learning the correct pronunciations of names and places involved in the case, clearly I struggle with English at the best of times, like the language I've been speaking my entire life. So if I do stuff up, just just feel free to call me out in the comments. It's fine. I can take it. It's not like I'm going to cry myself to sleep tonight or anything. Am I done rambling? I think I'm done rambling. Let's hop into the case. Shortly after 11 p.m. on the 11th of October 2014, Jennifer Laude, a 26-year-old trans-Filipina woman, was brutally murdered by a 19-year-old Marine, Lance Corporal Joseph Scott Pemberton. The two had met about a half an hour earlier in the city of Olongapo in the Philippines at a nightclub called Ambience. Jennifer had been having a drink with her friend Barbie Galvero and Joseph had been out on the town with three of his Marine Corps shipmates. They were on their first night of Liberty League or shore leave after weeks of joint military exercises with Philippine troops. Joseph approached Jennifer and Barbie and after speaking for just a few minutes, Jennifer agreed to accompany Joseph to Cell Zone Lodge, which was a motel literally just across the road from Ambience Nightclub. Barbie, Jennifer's friend, joined them and when they were all checked in at about 11.05 p.m., Barbie split ways, leaving Joseph and Jennifer alone. Half an hour after this, Joseph casually left the motel room, leaving the door slightly ajar. 15 minutes after this, Jennifer still hadn't emerged from the motel room, so the front office receptionist and her friend Barbie went in to check on her. When they entered the motel room, they quickly discovered Jennifer's lifeless body slumped against the toilet with her head in the toilet bowl. She was naked except for a white sheet covering the lower half of her body, and her autopsy would later reveal that she had died from asphyxiation by drowning. Upon this discovery, Philippine police were quickly called and an investigation was launched into Jennifer's death. So let's backtrack a little bit and talk about who Jennifer was. 
Jennifer was born on the 4th of November 1987. She had two sisters, Mary Lou and Michelle, and tragically her father died when she was only three years old. Jennifer's birth name was Jeffrey, but her mother, Julita, or Nane as she is referred to, always called her Gunda, which translates to beauty in English. Nane said that she knew from a very young age, as in from around five years old, that Jennifer was a girl and the Laude family fully supported and accepted Jennifer exactly as she was. Nane also said that Jennifer was a really loving child, that she always helped with the household chores and that she was a really diligent student as well. After graduating from high school in 2006 and studying hotel and restaurant services in college, College, Jennifer moved to Olongapo City to find a job to support her family. She ended up succeeding in finding a job in a beauty salon where she worked a lot of extra hours cleaning up the salon, washing clients' hair, that kind of thing, just so that she could get free meals. Jennifer would send most of her pay home to her mother, Nane, who had a heart condition and wasn't able to work. As a result of this, Nane was able to afford making repairs to her house and also to make the down payment on a tricycle for her husband, who made a living as a tricycle driver. Jennifer was described by those who loved her as beautiful, kind, generous and intelligent. She loved to sing and she loved cooking. Cooking was her passion. When she would go home to visit her mother in Leyte, she would cook huge feasts, not just for her family, but for her neighbors as well. She saw this as an opportunity to kind of share her blessings in what she knew having grown up there was an area that was stricken by poverty. Jennifer was engaged to a German man named Mark Susselbeck. They had a whirlwind romance. Uh, they originally met online and when Mark came to visit Jennifer in the Philippines, it wasn't long before he decided that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her and he proposed in December of 2013. On the 1st of October, literally 10 days before she was killed, Jennifer had been granted a visa so that they could get married. The wedding date was set and her dress was bought. Jennifer was excited about this new chapter in her life and she was madly in love with Mark. Now, when she headed out that night on the 11th of October 2014, it is alleged that Jennifer was engaging in sex work. And I'm sure some of you already had some questions brewing about this, but while it's widely accepted that Jennifer was a sex worker, her mother, Nane, and Mark, her fiancé, deny this. The only person, of course, that could confirm this for us would be Jennifer, but as we already know, sadly, she's not here to speak for herself. And so I'm not going to speculate in this video either way whether she was or was not a sex worker. What I will say is that it's not that uncommon in the Philippines for trans women to be very limited in the type of work that they're able to find because they face just a monumental amount of prejudice and discrimination from society in their public lives, in their social lives, and in their private lives. A transgender woman in the Philippines can be arrested for just walking down the street, depending on the arresting officer's personal interpretation of Article 200 of the Revised Penal Code, which penalizes anyone that offends against decency and good customs by any highly scandalous act. A lot of trans Filipina women will often work in the beauty industry, in beauty pageants and contests where they'll often have to be quite self-deprecating and almost be exaggerated parodies of themselves just for the entertainment of the audience. And if they're not working in the beauty industry, a substantial amount of Filipina trans women will find themselves working in the sex industry. A lot of them not by their own personal enthusiastic choice, but more so just to survive. And a lot of them will feel the need to hide their gender identity to be able to get work. So we should probably talk about Joseph Scott Pemberton as well, even though I really, really don't want to. 
Joseph was born on the 13th of December 1994 to his parents Joseph and Lisa Pemberton in New Bedford, Massachusetts. As a child, he was described as very gentle, kind and loving. His mother Lisa told reporters that she had never seen Joseph angry one time in his entire life and his uncle, an ex-professional boxer, said that he knew Joseph really well and that he was a good kid and that He personally felt there was more to the story. Joseph graduated from Greater New Bedford Regional Vocational Technical High School with a major in metal fabrication and joining in 2013 and promptly joined the Marine Corps. He served as an anti-tank missile operator for the 2nd Battalion 9th Marines of Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. In October of 2014, Joseph's ship, the USS Peleliu, docked in Subic Bay in the Philippines, where he took part in joint military training exercises with US and Philippine troops. And as I mentioned, on the 11th of October, his first night of liberty leave, he and his friends left Subic Bay to go to Olongapo City. Now, in the 60s and 70s, Olongapo was kind of a sin city, if you will. It attracted a lot of US servicemen from what was then Naval Base Subic Bay, which was pretty much just a stone's throw away from the city. That naval base was closed in 1992 when the Filipino Senate rejected a 10-year extension on the agreement that the US and the Philippines had in place. At the time, there was a lot of resentment growing in the Philippines against the US as while I'm sure most like majority of the US servicemen that were there were on their best behavior, there were a small amount that just weren't. These individuals tended to treat the Filipino people as second-rate citizens in their own country and there were also a lot of reports of violence and sexual assault by servicemen against Filipino women and children. But in 1998, amidst growing tension between the Philippines and China, the Philippines and the US signed the Visiting Forces Agreement, an agreement that will be of great significance later in this video. The agreement basically meant that the US would have a big military presence in the Philippines again and that they would come to their aid in cases of war or natural disasters. So after the Visiting Forces Agreement or the VFA was signed, Olongapo City once again became a prime destination for US servicemen on liberty leave while they were in the Philippines. And considering that the nightclub that Joseph Scott Pemberton and his shipmates went to was in the red light district of the city, we can pretty safely assume that they were there to seek the services of sex workers. Now, it seems the soldiers were briefed about the possibility of encountering trans sex workers while on liberty leave in Olangapo. But that night, Joseph's response upon discovering that Jennifer was a trans woman was to beat her, to place her in a chokehold and strangle her to the point of unconsciousness, to then drag her to the bathroom where he submerged her head in the toilet bowl until she drowned. Jennifer's autopsy revealed multiple bruises and injuries to her body, black bruising around her neck, a hematoma in her larynx caused by the huge amount of force used in the chokehold, and fluid in her lungs caused by drowning, which was ultimately what killed her. There was also evidence from Jennifer's injuries that she had offered very little defense or resistance during the brutal attack. After killing Jennifer, Joseph took a taxi back to Subic Bay where his ship was docked and grabbed one of his shipmates, Jen Michael Rose, and took him to the front of the ship where no one would hear them. He told Jen, and I'm quoting Joseph now even though it makes me sick to the pit of my stomach, he told Jen that he was worried he had killed a he-she that he got so angry when he saw it had a dick that he choked it from behind. 
Police questioned the front office receptionist at Cell Zone Lodge and he said that he had seen Jennifer go to the motel room with a white male foreigner about 25 to 30 years of age with a marine style haircut and five US marine ships were promptly placed on lockdown, unable to leave the Philippines during the investigation into Jennifer's death. One of these ships, of course, was Joseph's ship, the USS Peleliu. On the 14th of October, three days after Jennifer's death, Joseph was named a suspect by the Philippine National Police. Their police report called the crime a crime of hatred and suggested that Joseph's discovery of Jennifer being gay prompted him to kill her. Joseph was arrested, but even though the crime had taken place on Philippine soil, he was taken into US custody, not Philippine custody. And he was held right where he was on his ship, the USS Peleliu. See that thing I mentioned earlier, the Visiting Forces Agreement or the VFA, basically allows the US government to have complete jurisdiction over a US military personnel who has been accused of committing a crime in the Philippines, unless the crime is considered to be of special importance to the Philippines. So for a crime that's deemed insignificant, the US can straight up refuse to arrest or detain the accused, or if they do, they can just prosecute them under US jurisdiction. Even though the crime took place in the Philippines, which is supposed to be its own sovereign nation. Now, despite there being evidence of a multitude of violent crimes by servicemen against Filipino men, women, and children, there have only been two US servicemen tried in the Philippines. And in both cases, the US has used the VFA to keep the accused under US jurisdiction. One of these cases was an alleged gang rape of a Filipino woman named Suzette Nicholas. Suzette, or Nicole, as she was known to the media, claimed on the 1st of November of 2005, she was sexually assaulted by four US Marines in a moving van at Subic Bay, where the Marines' ship was docked. Nicole later amended her claim, saying that only one of the Marines, Lance Corporal Daniel Smith, raped her, while the other three Marines cheered him on. Daniel Smith claimed, however, that the sex had been consensual. Nicole was found later that night at a pier in Subic Bay, extremely drunk and crying. Her jeans were inside out and there was a condom sticking out of her underwear. Several witnesses came forward saying that they had seen Daniel carry Nicole out of the nightclub where they had met to the van. And also more witnesses said that they had seen Nicole being dumped at the pier by the Marines. Numerous court hearings took place over that year, during which time the four Marines were held under US custody at the US Embassy. On the 4th of December 2006, Daniel Smith was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in a Philippine jail. The other three Marines were acquitted due to lack of evidence. Now, Daniel Smith was temporarily held at the Philippine prison as per his sentence, but after less than a month, the US had him transferred back to the US Embassy, a highly criticised transfer that took place without warning in the middle of the night. During his incarceration at the US Embassy, Daniel Smith enjoyed a private air-conditioned room with views of Manila Bay. On the 17th of March 2009, Nicole's mother submitted an affidavit on her behalf in which Nicole said that she was no longer sure if she had been raped. And subsequently, on the 23rd of April of the same year, Daniel Smith was acquitted. The case received a huge amount of media attention worldwide and opinions were very divided. A lot of people felt that Nicole had been pressured to submit the affidavit or that an agreement had been reached behind the scenes where Daniel Smith's camp had made Nicole an offer too good to refuse. Daniel left home for the US less than 24 hours after his release. And the other case where the US have implemented the VFA is, of course, this one. 
Joseph Scott Pemberton was never allowed to be interviewed or investigated by the Philippine authorities. The evidence at the crime scene, including condoms and a condom wrapper, were taken by American investigators and never handed over to Philippine investigators for testing. And the report that was eventually handed over to Philippine authorities was confusing and contradictory. Joseph was officially charged with murder on the 15th of December 2014. The Philippines requested custody of him, but they were denied by the US, and instead he was taken to a US facility under US Guard in Camp Aguinaldo, which is a Philippines military base. In 2015, Joseph's lawyers filed an appeal to have the murder charge overturned, an appeal that was denied, and the trial began on the 23rd of March 2015. The trial was held in Olongapo City and it was not open to public. Not even the Filipino media were allowed inside the courtroom. They instead had to rely on secondhand accounts to report the story of the case. Protesters lined the streets outside the courtroom, holding signs demanding justice for Jennifer and calling for the removal of the US military from the Philippines altogether. Jennifer was misgendered throughout the trial, referred to by her birth name Jeffrey and by masculine pronouns. Lawyers Virgie Suarez and Harry Roque offered their services pro bono to the Laude family, with Virgie Suarez saying of the judicial system, if you you didn't have money, you didn't have access to justice. The Laude family had to deal with just truly hateful and cruel comments online about Jennifer during the trial and also rumours being spread about themselves. It was claimed that Nane had made a demand of 38 million pesos and six visas in return for dropping the charges against Joseph. This was a claim she shot down saying she had never even once considered or entertained the idea of accepting a deal or an offer in return for dropping the case that she was determined to fight for justice for her daughter, Jennifer. As I mentioned earlier, Nane lived in Leita and she was having to travel to Olongapo for the trial proceedings. And this was extremely time consuming and expensive, but she made it there for every day of the trial. So it's extremely frustrating that Joseph didn't even bother to show up for the preliminary hearing or the preliminary probe. He refused also to enter a plea. The court had to enter a not guilty plea on his behalf. The defense were also dragging their feet with their argument, postponing multiple hearings several times due to technicalities. They appeared to be stalling because did I mention that under the VFA, the Philippine court system has exactly one year to complete trial proceedings. Otherwise, the defendant can walk free. True story. So the trial began in March and Joseph didn't take the witness stand until August. When he took the witness stand, Joseph Scott Pemberton testified that he had killed Jennifer in self-defense. He claimed trans panic. And if you haven't heard the term trans panic before, just, just take a breath, just maybe pause the video and just collect yourself and prepare yourself for what you're about to hear. I'm already getting flushed. So Trans panic is a legal defense strategy in which the man on trial, and I say man because no woman has ever used this defense. Trust me, I looked it up. So the man on trial who is accused of assaulting or murdering another human being tries to justify themselves by claiming temporary insanity caused by the panic they experienced upon learning that the other human being that they assaulted or murdered was transgender. The strategy basically says that that human being's gender identity was to blame for the defendant's violent reaction 
up to and including murder. This is an actual thing. I'm not making it up. There's also the gay panic defense, which is similar, except that a straight man felt so incredibly offended and felt his honor was so incredibly attacked by the sexual advances of another male that he just had no choice but to brutally attack or murder them. Both trans and gay panic defenses are recognized by law courts around the world. And even though more often than not, the crimes that these defenses are used for are extremely violent and inhumane in a way that sets them apart from other cases. A US study found that in 32% of the cases where gay or trans panic was used as a defense, the defendant was able to get a lighter charge and less jail time. I did a lot of research on trans panic and gay panic, something I definitely would not recommend because I'm still fuming days later. Um, but I came across a lot of comments defending it, saying that it would be understandable in some scenarios, say if the man accused had been sexually assaulted by another man in the past. But if that's acceptable, I would like to know why straight panic isn't a thing for a woman who's killed a man because he made a sexual advance on her and she's a lesbian or she's one of the roughly one in five women that has been sexually assaulted by a man in her life. We all know this wouldn't stand up in court, so why should it be any different when it's a man that's accused? Sorry for being ragey, I just have to get this off my chest. Trans panic and gay panic are not valid defenses for battery and murder. It's legalized transphobic and homophobic victim blaming. The defenses have been banned in all states in Australia except South Australia and in nine states in the US, but it has not been banned in the Philippines. So for Joseph, trans panic it was. He testified that he was so repulsed and shocked and disgusted when he realized that Jennifer was transgender that he pushed her and when she went to slap him he punched her and then placed her in a chokehold. When he realized she was unconscious he dragged her to the bathroom where he claims he tried to revive her with water. When he couldn't do this he decided to leave her slumped against the toilet and left the motel room. Joseph's mother, Lisa Pemberton, testified as a character witness in the trial and she said that she just did not believe that Joseph could ever kill anyone and that there's no way he had a bias against the LGBTQ plus community because his sister was a lesbian and he was going to be best man at her wedding. Could someone please explain to Lisa Pemberton that that is not how transphobia works? Please. Please. On the 1st of December 2015, Joseph was found guilty of homicide, a charge that had been downgraded from murder thanks to his trans panic defense. In the Philippines, this would usually mean 20 to 40 years jail time, but Joseph received a sentence of... Six to 12 years. Six to 12 years, that's it. He was also ordered to pay a total of 4.3 million pesos in civil liability damages to the Laude family, which equates to roughly 94,000 USD. Now, the judge ordered for Joseph's incarceration to take place at New Billy Bid Prison, a Philippine prison. The prison housed over 26,000 inmates who slept in crowded cell blocks and it had no air conditioning. So on a hot day, temperatures could exceed 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit inside. There were also frequent disease outbreaks in this jail. So this sentence creates one of the biggest standoffs of all time. Philippine authorities want to transfer Joseph to New Bilibid Prison, but he is surrounded by a circle of high-ranking U.S. soldiers, NCIS officers, and U.S. embassy staff that refuse to let them to do this. So it was Joseph, U.S., the Philippines, and this standoff lasted for three hours. 
The Philippines eventually backed down and Joseph was transferred back to his cushy, private, air-conditioned cell at Camp Aguinaldo. And here's something else to be angry about. Even though Joseph was found guilty of killing Jennifer, he never lost his rank in the Marines during his incarceration, and he also continued to receive his monthly salary of about $2,300 a month, totaling $160,000 during his incarceration. The Marine Corps also paid his entire legal fees, totaling about half a million US dollars. So he was just doing it really tough. Okay, guys, you don't understand how hard this was for him. In January 2016, Joseph's lawyers submitted an appeal to have the conviction overturned. And in March of the same year, Joseph's maximum sentence was reduced to 10 years. Can you imagine if Joseph Scott Pemberton killed someone in the United States and then only served 10 years for it? Oh, you can't imagine that? Me either. But um, in August of 2020, literally last year, just after Joseph had served just shy of six years, still in his private air-conditioned cell created just for him at Camp Aguinaldo, Court proceedings began to determine whether Joseph was eligible for early release under the Philippines Good Conduct Time Allowance Law or the GCTA law. And the Olongapo court ended up giving him a perfect GCTA score, granting him early release after serving just five years and 10 months of his already ridiculously lenient 10-year sentence. The Laude family quickly filed a motion to reconsider the decision, questioning how Joseph's GCTA score had even been calculated seeing as he wasn't technically in prison. And seeing as he was being held under the VFA, the GCTA law shouldn't have even applied to him. On the 3rd of September, a court order was put out for the release of Joseph based on his perfect GCTA score. But in a very controversial move, the Department of Justice refused to release him, saying that the motion to reconsider by the Laude family would have to be processed first. But all of this was made null and void when on the 7th of September 2020, Joseph Scott Pemberton was granted a full pardon by the President of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte. And if you haven't heard the name Duterte before, this guy is a piece of work. I, we could do a whole video on Duterte. He grabbed worldwide media attention when he made jokes about sex and rape during his presidential campaign and referred to members of the US military as sons of whores during his rallies. Duterte is most well known, however, for making good on his promise to the Philippine people to litter Manila Bay with the bodies of criminals with his war on drugs. And during this war, Duterte openly and enthusiastically encouraged Philippine police and vigilantes to kill drug users and drug dealers in death squad style shootings without a trial. And because of the unregulated way these shootings have been carried out, no one knows the exact number of people that have been killed. It's estimated to be anywhere between 6,000 and 20,000. President Duterte had made a promise to the Laude family that during his presidency, Joseph would never walk free. He also gave them cash aid multiple times since 2017 to show his support for their fight for justice for Jennifer. But he apparently had a change of heart and said that Joseph had been treated unfairly by the Philippines and so he decided to give him a full pardon. There were, of course, was a huge public outcry. Um, there were protests held in Olangapo City and the cap capital city of Manila. It was declared that this was an anti-trans move made by the very conservative Duterte that exposed the Philippine government's tolerance of hate crimes against transgender people. This was a move that said to the LGBTQ plus community of the Philippines that that even in their own country, if they were of a particular gender, 
their lives mattered less. The president had people supporting the decision as well, though, including one of the Laude family's lawyers, Harry Roque, who said that according to Philippine law, Joseph had done his time. The hashtag justice for Jennifer Laude pretty much instantly shot to number one in Twitter's trending topics in the Philippines upon news of Joseph's pardon being released with multiple high profile celebrities and politicians in the Philippines calling Duterte out. As well as being called a gross injustice to Jennifer herself, the pardon was also labeled a mockery of the judicial system and an affront to the sovereign of the nation. But despite this public outcry, Joseph Scott Pemberton was released on the 13th of September 2020. He was deported from the Philippines in a US military cargo plane to an undisclosed location back home in the US. A free man. Joseph left behind a letter for the Laude family in which he extended his most sincere sympathies for the pain he had caused. The letter basically said that in the years he had spent in confinement, he had taken a lot of time to contemplate his errors and that he wished he had the words to explain the depth of his sorrow and regret. American authorities made promises that Joseph would face court martial proceedings to decide if any additional punishment would be imposed upon his return to the US, but this never happened. He was instead processed for administrative discharge from the Marine Corps, which is basically what happens when you've done something wrong, but the Marine Corps doesn't have enough evidence to penalize you. You know, like a homicide conviction in the Philippines, that kind of evidence. So basically this means that Joseph Scott Pemberton's punishment for killing Jennifer Laude was spending a few years in a nice jail cell and losing his job. That's it. So that is the end of today's video. Tell me what you guys think down in the comments. Do you think Jennifer deserved more than this, that the punishment should have been way harsher? Or do you think that Joseph served his time and that the punishment was adequate. Thank you so much for spending this time with me and I hope you enjoyed the video as much as you could with it being such a aggravating case. I think Lily would like to say bye. Do you? I think Lily is hungry. As usual, she's like a bottomless pit. Are we okay? <laughs> All right, guys, I have to go feed her or she's going to start eating my plants. Um, have just a great week and thank you so much for spending time with me. I love you and I will see you next time. Bye. Are you just standing creepily in the background waiting for me to feed you? Sass.